Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full show times, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Do you have an app idea that you've been dreaming about but don't know how to actually start building it? Use Bubble. I've been using Bubble for a number of years now. It's an extremely powerful, no-code platform that enables you to build, launch, and scale real products without investing thousands of dollars on engineers, designers, or spending time trying to code it yourself. Use Bubble's visual drag-and-drop tool to create really anything from marketplaces, SaaS products, and so much more. Join over 2 million people, including myself, already using Bubble to launch and grow businesses. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Patrick Berglund. He's the CEO and co-founder at Zanetta. Patrick, welcome to the show. Hey, Kevin. Good to be on. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I think what you guys are doing at Zanetta is very, very important. But maybe before we get into all that, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm 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 from a tiny town uh, in Norway, right? So okay. cool. south of Oslo, forty thousand people. Then uh, then moved to Oslo to to basically study after I was in the army, which was mandatory back then. I'm starting to get old, <laughs> um, and. Uh, Finished business class and and randomly ended in, uh, into, I kind of stumbled into supply chain, chain to be honest, and and found it super interesting in terms of the global nature of it, and where sort of cargo flows and and where everything is built and made and how you source these products and then you know move them around the globe, um, and that got me stuck in the industry, so yeah, that's that's like the origins I guess from from okay. my time. So, what made you get or what made you passionate about business at such an early age? I don't. To be honest, it, it's a great question. I I had a, a fantastic lecture that was super like uh, energetic, vibrant, uh, enthusiastic. So so I, I get. To, I think it's pretty much down to that. That that caught my attention, okay. which you know made me want to explore. Uh, supply chain as, a, as an occupation, and then I ended up working in Kunanagel, which is a you know seventy thousand employee big company, and all they do is freight. So, working out of Oslo, I very early on sort of were, I was triggered by that international vibe, whether it was Vietnam, US. Uh, something in the UK or Europe or Australia, everything was like, all of a sudden you go to work with like people all over the world. I was very sort of dazzled by that. Yeah. Sure. And okay. So walk us through your career up until becoming a founder. Yeah. I, listen, I've had jobs since I was 13 years old. Oh, wow. uh, yeah. I've had all kinds of shit jobs you can think of, but um <laughs> Mm, but I also did like some different stuff. Like I, I helped the elderly when I was like 15 and 16, like, uh, you know, going home to them, these kind of home care services. Okay. That was like an odd job. And I ended up, you know, doing anything from feeding them, giving them medicines to like cleaning them. It was bizarre, especially in that age, you know, it, it, but it, it really made me reflect a lot about life. And then I've had the typical you know, and jobs, anything from McDonald's to a deli. But the, uh, then I started studying. I did actually some telemarketing as well, which was, I think, incredibly educational. All that stuff but, is that you outlined, I think, is very educational for a number of yeah, reasons, right? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Actually, you're right. Absolutely. What I liked about uh, telemarketing is that you, you have such a limited um, tool, right? You have, only have your own voice and you just hammer phone calls and you got to convince people to buy something just by utilizing your voice so you eventually become really savvy at like okay what kind of persona is this and how do you adjust your 
your pace, your volume, and what kind of pitch you have. And yeah, anyway, so so I did those kind of jobs. Studied, uh, went to the army, studied, studied, and then started working for Kinanaga, with which was international logistics. And I actually got my first like entrepreneurial experience there because when you, a, a freight forwarder is like a middleman, right? They don't own the vessels, the, the, the planes, the trucks. So they buy capacity and sell it to a customer. And the business model is simply you buy something and add a, add a percentage. Right. So we wanted, we wanted to find a business model that aligned the incentives of our customers with our own, meaning when you buy something and sell it off, the only thing you want to do is add as much as you possibly can. Right. right. So what we wanted to do is to find a model that allowed us to go to customers and say, we're going to make it as cheap as we possibly can with any transport around the world. And the better we make that sort of price tag versus quality, of course, the better we make that for you, the more you're going to pay us. And we're going to measure the effect of our job. And, and then the better we are, the more happy you will be to pay us. So in some way, it's all about optimization, whether it's route optimization, capacity utilization, any projects that we could come up with, really, whether it was moving warehouses, centralizing it, anything that optimized their supply chain. And they you know, allowed us to work with this for about two years. And that business unit became really profitable. And that's, that's the origin, actually, of Zanetta, because working through that, we realized that, you know, the market is so broken. It's so, it's so volatile and so opaque that the customers struggle to understand what they should pay at any given time. Right. Right. And interesting. And I, yeah. And I, I thought about this, like this is now more than 10 years ago and almost anything I could imagine that I could buy, I could Google. Yeah. I, and get like an indication. Where is the market? What is the price? And, and what should I expect? But if you started Googling, what should Adidas get from Shanghai to Los Angeles with their volumes for a long-term contract? There is absolutely no data on that. Wild. Interesting. Okay. So what made you actually decide to build the company and how has it evolved over the last decade or so to what it is today maybe yes. i'm talking maybe about some of the similarities and differences between the last decade because i think probably and you can correct me if i'm wrong some of it's probably pretty similar and some of it's probably like a complete 180 and everywhere in between yeah but let's let's um so we do air and ocean shipments okay. to, uh, to begin with but let's let's hone in on ocean freight and okay. let's think about the underlying challenge in this industry so imagine you and i ran a shipping line okay. now we wanted to order new vessels and we wanted them to be bigger to achieve economies of scale so we're going to order them today and they're going to be deployed in the market in four years oh, wow. now in four years you and i need to make up our mind whether we should deploy it between asia to us or asia to europe or you transatlantic north south which trade so we make some assumptions and hope and cross our fingers that global trade will sort of continue on its trajectory in terms of growth, because then this vessel will be needed, which, by the way, we pay a lot for it, right? There's millions of dollars we're going to soak into this. Now, let's say that, that we deploy that vessel, but Donald Trump was just elected president. We deployed it on Trans-Pacific going into the US and Donald Trump was elected president. We didn't see that coming because the stats were not in his favor, but okay. Right. He becomes president, he starts a trade war with China. That has US importers front load cargo to avoid tariffs, right? Yep. Which has capacity on Trans-Pacific really tight, which we're super happy about, right? It's great for us because now rates are booming and we deployed our vessel there. Then another example would be that we deployed the vessel on Asia to Europe, but uh, ever given blocked the Suez Canal, right? right? Yeah. Or it could be Brexit, or it could be uh, forests, uh, for, 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 uh, for, uh, forest fires in Australia or Taiwan situation or Ukraine. It could be Yellow West protest in France. There's these things that happens that rattles this industry that changes how much goods are moved around the globe and 
we're suffering because you and I, as a shipping line, we're trying to deploy the exact right capacity at the exact right point in time. And it's just impossible to predict. So you, you'll you never find equilibrium. And COVID is a beautiful, beautiful example. COVID hits, everybody expects the worst crisis for global trade. So they pull out capacity. Oh, wow. Guess what? Everybody was buying more. They should have injected more capacity. Now, maybe they shouldn't have because when, when there was so little capacity and so high demand, rates skyrocket. They go up seven, eight hundred percent. Right. Everything kind of goes to ship for everybody besides the shipping lines. Right? Right. So the, what I'm saying is nobody's able to predict this. Nobody's like you can't look at any historical data. It will tell you nothing about what's going to happen going forward. So, Interesting. Yeah. yeah, I guess. I hey, well, never thought of it like that, but you're right. You're totally right. Yeah, that's fascinating. And and the, yeah, and then then the challenge is is if let's say you're uh, Nike or Walmart or doesn't matter any brand, any pharma companies, automotive company, any industry. Occasionally, they're going to go and buy ocean freight, and that occasionally is is the sum of six hundred billion dollars changing hands every year, and they dip their toes in. And the market is different every time they dip their toes in. So, yeah, I'm saying it's it's super complex in many ways. Uh, a lot of stakeholders and very little transparency. And that's what Zanetta does. We make it transparent. Okay, so how do you do that then? Yeah, that's that. interesting. So when I was working at uh, Cunanagle, right, the biggest freight forwarding company in the world, we pitched the whole idea. We should make the market transparent. We quickly realized that there was no appetite for that because if you're selling something and the customer doesn't know what they should pay, that's a huge advantage, right? So we realized that you can't look at the sell side. They will never help you achieve this mission, but you can go to the buy side. If you go to all of these customers, whether it's, I think these brands that I mentioned, automotive companies, pharma companies, retail, FMCG, they have all negotiated a little bit of contracts with the shipping lines. So individually, right. they know what they're paying. Think Shanghai to Los Angeles, as I mentioned. They know themselves. Now, if you theoretically could collect 100, 200, 300 of them and put them in the same room and they all told each other, what are you paying between Shanghai to Hamburg or Los Angeles? They will all be informed. So that is the right way to think about Sonera. We built that pool, a critical mass of hundreds of large volume companies that all feeds in their freight contracts into the meta. And then to make it legal, we can't tell company A what company B is paying, but we aggregate it into an average and a spread, and then you get to see your own contracts in light of that. Ah, interesting, okay. That means that you have an initial chick initial, uh, initial chicken and egg problem, right? So, right. so the first companies we reached out, we, we did four years free of charge, no subscription. The only thing you paid with was if you were willing to give your data, you would get access because it's proprietary data. So when I called around for these four first years, which was horrible, to be honest, I, I needed to kind of use my telemarketing skills again because I needed to tell a compelling story about where this would go if they gave us their proprietary data, that we could make the market transparent together, right? Yeah, okay. So you managed to convince somebody. The vast majority just says, forget it. I, I like the idea, maybe, you know, to make the market transparent would be great for me, but I'm not giving my data away until you have others who give the data away. But you get some data, and let's say you get some data on, on, on Shanghai to Los Angeles, right? Yeah. Then you try to find the next importer or exporter that would have the same trade route, right? Yep. Now you have a limited period of time to do that because any price has a predefined valid from and valid to. So if you're not quick enough, the data you receive from company A is going to expire and you'll need to call them back and say, hey, appreciate you gave me that proprietary data. Can you give me the new set? Because I'm trying to get others on board and I've been not successful so far. Make sense? Totally. Yeah. Interesting. So... <laughs> It took four years, um, and I think we reached a few million prices at that point. 
accumulated over those four years. Now we get about 10 million prizes a month into the platform. Okay. okay. So I want to step back a little bit. So four years is a long time yeah. to, to go through building a product. And I think, yeah. but the reality is, is that's what it takes a lot of time to actually build a product. And I think a lot of people don't understand that. So I guess a couple questions to you is how did you fund it? And the bigger question is, is how did you keep going? Because yeah. that's a long time to grind, right? And a lot of people don't yeah. have it in them to do it. No, I, I thought about that a lot, to be honest. I'm not sure I would have done it over. And maybe if I did it over, maybe I could find some ways to do it faster. But but it was a true conviction that this data was really valuable. Because you're right, it takes a long time to build a product. But we have to build a product and get the data in order for it to have any meaningful value combined, right? 100%. And and I think I think it was beneficial that I was around 28 when we started. So so um, that meant that I had even more energy and more grit, I guess, than and that maybe I would have had today, or more patience in some way, or impatience. It's a it's a combination, I guess. And then we the way we funded it is that we we raised capital from venture okay. capitalists, and we could show a growing data growth. So we right. did the entire thing on, on, on like a database that grew. And then we had a compelling story as to why this data is valuable and especially valuable at scale and how you will build a moat around this business. The more companies you get on board because they all provide proprietary data, meaning they will be very hard for others to do the same or to convince uh, the same companies to give that data away. And finally, from a gross margin point of view, if you think about Zanetta, they all provide data and pay to get access as per today, right? So you have no raw material cost. And that's what we said in the early days. We make this fly, eventually we start turning the key and they'll start to pay. And what we charge four years in, we charge more than 10x now on average. So, so not only you know, is, are you able to at some point turn around and charge, you're able to increase price all the time because the value in the platform increases with every participant that joins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. That's actually rare to find. Yes. Like, yeah, you. it's like you captured lightning in a bottle, right? Because they can't, you're right, they can't really go anywhere else because there's no need to. And you won't be getting the, the data. Yeah. So if you have, if yeah, you have 400 large, big fortune type 500 companies in the same room mm -hmm. and somebody else starts it and say, hey, I need, I need one to join that room, it's zero value to go into that room. Yeah, hundred percent. So, you have some of the biggest brands yeah. globally using the platform now. Walk us through how do I onboard my company? I know you quickly kind of covered it, but walk me through how do I kind of onboard? How long does it take? And then over time, walk me through the journey. I get that it's when it's audio only, it's kind of hard to talk about something visual, but mm -hmm. can you maybe try to walk us through how people use the platform long-term? Yeah. So, so, so the first thing we do, so when we sort of figure out the, we, we, so we have our ICP, right? And then we f find the contact people and then we start doing the, the outreach to, uh, to sort of get their attention. Once we're there, we start demoing our software with um, real life use cases, meaning they get to see how it looks like for an other equivalent company, just anonymized, right? Right. Meaning, um, and then, and then from there, we offer a free value assessment. We say, listen, we have an idea about where you move cargo around the world, how much you move, and we have no idea about price. What we will do for you is that if you give us all your proprietary data, as, as everybody else does, and now it's the threshold is much smaller now because they can see. And they can speak to other customers who does it. And uh, we do NDAs and everything is fine and safe now. But um, if you give that data, we'll do a free of charge value assessment. So we will tell you which trade routes around the world do you pay more than the market average or the market high or low so that you get to see this in today's market. Tomorrow and the day after, it's gonna be different because the market moves. So we're gonna give you value today so you can see a tangible dollar value from subscribing to our platform. 
That is value in itself for you. If you decide not to subscribe, that's fine. But what we really equip ourselves with is a very strong business case, right? So that allows us to have a much more fact-based data-driven conversation with our prospect because they get to see how they perform in the market versus the database and exactly which one of their suppliers at which trades are sort of ripping them off potentially, right? Mm, fascinating. So it's a no-brainer, right? Because if you could prove to them that you're going to save them money, they're going to keep the conversation going and want to use the platform. That is, that is how we look at it. And then once you, once you get onboarded, then we focus on like four main use cases that they can leverage around the year. One is just monitoring and keeping track of the market. The other one is like deep benchmark. So if you're a pharma company, how do you perform against other pharma companies? If you're automotive, how do you stack up? And then it's uh, the RFQ. So when you actually negotiate the prices with your suppliers, we will tell you through the different rounds of bidding, who's, where can you still push? Where is there still improvement there is? So if you have a thousand trade routes around the world or 5,000, we will tell you out of these 5,000, do not focus on these 3,000. Here's the 2,000 that you still can gain something from, right? So sorry to interrupt you. What, what do you mean by gain something from? Like so, what yeah. am I gaining or what am I tweaking there? Mm. Sorry, uh, okay. So let's say that um, uh, you're a US-based importer. Uh, you have uh, tons of trades around the world. Now, you're, what you do is that you go out with an RFQ, a, a tender. Do you, do you know what that is, right? So you, uh, you, yeah. you go well, to maybe all explain possible, that quickly. Yeah? Sorry. You yeah. go to all possible suppliers okay. of ocean freight shipping, and then you say, I have 50,000 container boxes that I'm going to move over the next 12 months on these 2,000 trade routes. Please give me your best price. They submit their best price. You take all of that data, go back and say, okay, Here's where I see my suppliers performing. Then you take the Zanetta data and you say, oh, relative to the market, none of them price Santos in Brazil to Newark in a competitive way. So what Zanetta tells them then is out of the 2,000, you have already achieved something good on 1,000. But 1,000 trades around the world, you can still optimize, meaning reduce prices further down relative to what is available in the market. Okay. And so why the fluctuation? Like what are things that cause that number to be higher or lower in those shipping routes? Is it just, they're not getting as much people so sending stuff while you're trying to send or, or what happens there? So when you have a volatile market, so the volatility stems from what I described earlier, how to, how to reach an equilibrium between okay. uh, supply and demand. And then that volatility causes a huge spread. Right, so some right. is paying way more because the sell, savvy sales guy pulled that deal off and somebody ah. has massive vol. It's all individually negotiated. There's no central clearinghouse in this wild. industry. It's wild. It's, 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 I usually say it's $600 billion where they buy and sell in Excel spreadsheets. And that's the reality to it. Interesting. So, so, okay. so that makes sense how you can use the data to negotiate better deals and then finally budgeting. Right? So we, we know if company A, B, or C is coming to the end of their contracts, right? and we know that they contracted in when the market was here or here, doesn't matter, high or low, now we will tell them based on what you have achieved in the market. So let's say your position was market average minus 5%. Now the market has moved from when you contracted and it was high, let's say, so, say that. So now we can tell you based on our data and what's possible to achieve in the market today. And if you can replicate your position of being 5% below the market average, here's your new budget. So that they can go internally to their final finance department and say, hey, we're not going to spend 150 million US dollars next year. Zanetta has estimated our budget to come in at 70 million US dollars. Make sense? Yeah. Interesting. Or, or vice cool. versa. Vice versa. It's even it, arguably more powerful if, if the budget goes up. Because when you then go to your finance director, they will say, oh, oh, why are we going to double our ocean freight spend? Then they have our market data to say, well, if we double it, we're still in line with the market. It's the perfect sort of performance. Yeah. Fascinating. Okay. Interesting. So I keep thinking about this one thing you, you, kept, you said a while ago is obviously when you were pitching to people early on, 
They were like, call me back when somebody else is using it, right? How did you finally land that first customer or first few customers to trust you? Because I think that's really hard yeah. for a lot of startups in the early days. Yeah, it is incredibly hard, listen. Uh, and I think you need to understand the pain and this is the benefit from, the, what we're doing is such a niche thing if you think about it, right? But, but still 70% of global trade goes into these container boxes, 70%. It's a massive industry, wow. but, but it's, it's very few that sort of gets it and understands it. I used to work in it for a lot of years, so I could tell them, or I could, I could have a good conversation with the prospects about the pain they were feeling, about uh, the lack of transparency. Yeah. Yes. And then I could say, listen, there is no interest from those, that sell side that provides you with those services to ever make it transparent. But if we can gang and group together a bunch of ah, you, you can you can find out. So it's, it, it is all about that storytelling in the beginning. And then, as I said, the vast majority is going to be no's, right? And then eventually you find somebody that says, yeah, that makes sense. And I'm so annoyed about that volatility and that, that lack of transparency. I'll take, I'll go on a limb and I'll give you my data, right? But of course we, we, we signed NDAs and we did right. like everything we could to support it. And I also think it helped to come, um, to establish this company out of Norway because the, the country has um, a meaningful sort of perceived trust in, in, in global trade and, and uh, history within shipping. So, yeah. Interesting. That's, no, that's fascinating. That's actually really good advice. So. I'm curious, so you, you kind of covered it, but I want to dive a little bit deeper into it. So I've been using the platform for, say, three months, six months. What, what kind of stuff do I continuously get from the software outside of just like, oh, you know, like this is the new rate? Is there other things I get or, or walk us through that? Yeah, so, so you know the four use cases I said? Yeah. Uh, those are the primary sort of uh, reasons as to why you would return. And just understanding and sort of monitoring the market has immense value. Now, I got to I got to share that you know we we started going to the uh, demand side because my hypothesis is always supply will follow demand, right? Unless you can discover something new that people want, you should listen to the customers of in terms of what they really want and really understand it. And I think we understood that they would like this transparency, so we went for that. But we always said that if we could bring the biggest companies in the world and have them push our pricing data, our intelligence to the suppliers, eventually the suppliers will budge and join the platform, right? So, so think about it because yeah, what you're doing is that you're, you're tilting information asymmetry in favor of the customer, leaving the seller to be a little bit, oh shit, how do you know that the <laughs> Tokyo to Sydney is down 30%, right? Yeah. So today we work with four of the six biggest shipping lines in the world, eight of the te top 10 global forwarders. And, and all they did for the first few years was threatening us with lawsuits. It's my data, it's proprietary data. You can't have that. I've been in so many meetings. The beautiful thing is we always told them that, listen, if you wanna prohibit us from getting the data, you go to your most important customers and you say, you can't feed your data into NetApp because we have a confidentiality clause. Now, when you as a seller tell your customer that, you're telling them that you're ripping them off and it, you don't want them to see it. <laughs> right? so, so totally, interesting. That, that how this plays out is, is inevitably, it, it was inevitable for me that it would end up like this. And um, yeah, I think this is where we are at the moment. Uh, and then, sorry, you, your question was around the use cases and what do they get back to and use the platform for, right? And the reason I told this story is because the sell side is actually even more engaged with the platform because for them, it's core business. As for uh, the automotive company, it's not core business. So they dip their toes, as I said, into the market every now and then and get frustrated by it. But the sell side has actually, I arguably, and I would say this even more value from this data because this is their daily business so we can see very different usage from these three segments right so that's one part of my answer and the second thing is that we have expanded from price into capacity reliability right. emissions which i call like complementary data sets that we've been working on so the sort of 
you don't only want to provide visibility from Shanghai to Los Angeles on price, but also how who's polluting more or less if I choose this one versus that one and so right. forth. Yeah. Fascinating. Okay. Interesting. And then yeah, the sales side is actually really interesting. So walk us through or dive a little bit deeper into how they use the platform because then they can just basically say, well, we are competitive. We've already verified the data with an objective third party. And then, yes. then some. So I would say I, I would say there's a couple of things. So A, you would use it to optimize your margins to make sure that you you're giving the right reductions relative to the market, but not too much. Right. So I've since I've been on the sell side, we were always worried the customer would leave us and we always felt the pressure. Now we came up with the idea when we were working for the sell side and I said it would be the best tool and market intel that I could have in order to create lifetime value with our customers because every year they go out with their RFQs as I described the tender and we need to avoid that and the best way to avoid that is to show that they don't need to do it because they're in line with the market they're not bottom they're not top but in line with the market they should stay with us so all of these things can just everything that the buyer is benefiting from can almost be flipped and say the sellers can do the same and I would say that it's like share of wallet and lifetime value those are the two things that they should leverage the data to drive with their customer in their customer relationships yeah interesting so i'm curious what is the supply chain state of the industry right now because i think we've all been affected by it for a number of different ways so has it where are we at now we're at a stage where uh more or less on a global scale, there is a surplus of everything. It's like calm. Right? Supply chains breathe more healthy now. Um, there are that that's a, a, a holistic sort of approach. If you look transatlantic, it's much tighter. There's always things in some north south trades that's still a bit jacked up and, and, and so forth. But overall now it's much calmer waters. There's an oversupply relative to demand. If you see in, in January, imports into the West Coast of the US dropped 27 or 28% year over year. Oh, wow. It, it's fa fallen off a cliff. Now, shipping lines hasn't pulled out the equivalent capacity. So there's a huge amount of vessels and space available, which has had prices going from, let's say, around peak of $10,000 on average to like $1,900. Oh, wow. Right? Okay. So it's fallen off a cliff. Shipping lines will now start to, it's, it's bizarre. At the peak through COVID, they were making more profits than, uh, is it called the Fung shares? Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, it's a, you have a few yeah. of them. The shipping lines, think about that. Steel movers were making bigger profits. There's 10 shipping lines in the world that makes up more than 90% of global trade. They printed more money in the profits than these other tech companies, right? Right. Which is bizarre. Anyways, um, now they're going to struggle to be profitable even. That's how bad yeah. it's changed. And, and this means that the only, the only thing I find almost um, bizarre is that shipping lines controls the vessels. They... They are the ones that sit on capacity and they've learned through COVID that as long as we restrain capacity, we will make a huge amount of money because right. the, these, this cargo needs to be moved, whether it's pharmaceuticals or a, a retails or automotive companies, they need to be moved. And whether you, you know, multi-source to go from a bit more cargo from Europe and not have this dependency on, on let's say China, or you go Southeast Asia or South America, it still goes on these same vessels, right? And shipping lines, all they need to do is like, they're, they're almost their worst enemies because they just need to pull down capacity where the customers hardly can get on the vessels because then rates skyrocket. Ah, yes, okay, interesting. And it's, it's, it's 10 shipping lines, as I said, and they're grouped into three alliances. That's, that's the three alliances that takes care of global trade for us. And 30 years ago, the top, hold on, the top five shipping lines had about 20, 25% market share globally. 
yeah. top five today has more than 70%. So what we've seen over a few decades is shipping lines being forced out of the market because of you know this incredibly volatility and weak market conditions for periods of time where it's been mergers and acquisitions. Eventually, you end up with a few players dominating the market, and at some point, they will control that capacity so that they always make good money. Interesting. So how does air freight play into all this? Is it the exact same? Is it quite different? Obviously, yeah. like... Yeah. Um... <laughs> That's a great question. It's, it's, uh... <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, Kevin. keep going. It's, uh, it's pretty much the same. It's more okay. fragmented on the airline side. But I'll tell you a funny story about this. So back in the 80s, uh, more and more international freight was uh, starting to move around. And airlines was moving passengers, but they got more and more requests for cargo. And this was an annoying thing, a burden to, to deal with. Then there was these friendly companies called freight forwarders who said, hey, you shouldn't be bothered with that. How about you leave it with us and we will consolidate it and package it so that instead of having 100 customers requesting this, you'll have me and I will pack it all together and send you like one request, right? Uh, so the airlines bought into that and started working with the forwarders. Now, uh, you go a decade forward around the 90s KLM, Air France, and one more, I think it was, realized that, shit, we're giving away too much power to this middleman, right? So they went out and said, now you can book directly with us. You don't need to go through this middleman. We're going to take that business ourselves, right? Obviously, because it had grown in volume. It was attractive. So all the forwarders just collectively moved all the volume away from KLM and Air France, <laughs> which had them go back to the market and say, hey, you can't book with us. you got to go through this middleman. So that's the biggest difference between air and ocean that is controlled by DHL, Kuhn and Nagel, DSV, uh, FedEx, UPS. Yeah. Interesting how that played, how like it's totally. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So how do you think they pulled that off though? Because that's tricky, right? Or it was yeah, kind but... of a big gamble. There's, there's like uh, 20 years, right, of, of build up here, okay, uh, 15, 20 years where, where the folders just accumulate so much volume eventually that once the shipping lines realized that they'd done a foolish strategic choice, it was too late. Right. Okay. Interesting. But for so, us as a company, it doesn't really matter that much. We work with the airlines, the forwarders, and the same end customers. And the same end customers, automotive company or anything, pharma, they do both air and ocean transportations. And we, that's why we cater to them both. The key thing why we've chosen it is that it's volatile opaque for both modes. And the combinatorics is limited from A to B. So you've got to go from an airport to an airport or an ocean port to an ocean port. Whereas if you look at trucking, it's almost endless in terms of combinatorics. You can go from anywhere to anywhere with trucks. There's many different types of trucks. So it would be very hard to bring 100 companies into the same room and they talked about their trucking and they would get tons of value from it. But due to the limited combinatorics in air and ocean, they will get value. Did, did that make sense? Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, because you don't get this. Well, I've never really had it explained to me like that or really understood how how it really works, right? Yeah. Fascinating. So I'm curious though, with the supply chain side of things and all kind of the good, bad and other things going on on the planet right now, like it, it seems to me without maybe getting political that some countries are kind of saying, hey, we can really do this for you when we can handle some of the manufacturing and actually getting, you know, your goods and services to, to parts of the world. And you should move away from, you know, certain countries because of, you know, whatever, what's, whatever is happening. How do you see that? And like, is that really going to happen? And I think the biggest thing right now is like you yeah. said it earlier with like the U S and China. Right. But then there's other countries that are like, Hey, we'll manufacture your iPhone or whatever. Right. And mm -hmm. ship it to you. Like, how, is that, and I get it's really complicated to, to move a whole production line, but is the supply chain side of that just as complicated to move to another country or not really? Or, or how does that kind of work? In, in principle, not, right? So, so a lot of 
the actual transportation, I think, is some of the easiest components to, to work around. I okay. think there's there's a few decades of now know-how uh, that we've sort of you know sunk into uh, Asia, right? Okay. Yeah. So I'm not thinking I'm not thinking China necessarily, but you go Vietnam, India, Bangladesh. There's there's tons of these countries, right? Where we we built up um, machinery and a know-how, and you have a, a, a human ca a compo a capital component sort of there. That is, it's a pretty nice setup. Moving that is going to take a long time. What I'd rather see that companies do it that is that they multi-source, so they, they reduce their de dependency somewhat and find maybe something in Turkey, Eastern Europe, South America, LATAM, those kind of things. But they're not moving the majority. Right, because yeah, they're so, okay. you see what I mean? But they yeah. reduce their their dependencies so that if any disruption similar to what we sort of went through, then they can more easily scale up elsewhere. Okay. And then it'll be a gradual shift if they choose to over the next, you know, five yeah. plus years. That's, yeah. okay. Yes, that's what I'm thinking as well. So, and then uh, on top of that, the, the biggest sort of volume we've seen has been like to neighboring countries, you know, Thailand, uh, Vietnam, right. and so forth. Yeah. Fascinating. So you've been in the game a long time. Any other predictions or thoughts about things that we can expect kind of in the global supply chain industry in the next few years? Or is it just kind of who knows? No, I mean, it, I, I I love that we call it like black swans or whatever They're And they're supposed to be rare. They're yeah. just not rare. They're all the time. They're frequent. Okay. Uh, and I can I can sort of list up. 15, 20 of them the last four years, right? five years. Sure. Um, and I, the only thing I think we should be aware of is that they will continue to happen because they're uh, sort of outside of our control. And for companies, it's super hard to deal with them. What I think they should uh, be more sophisticated is, is contingency planning and, and having uh, alternative solutions because now there's more appetite to invest in that and it didn't be it always used to be just in time everything costs pushed down and just in time and now i think there's room to think differently about supply chains and st stability for businesses to be resilient and, and profitable in difficult times as well yeah you know that makes sense so then how does that affect you as a software business and your roadmap because so many things are constantly changing or happening. How do you manage that roadmap and that feature request? Because you and I both know it's just because I dreamt up a feature today doesn't mean it's deployed tomorrow, right? Yeah. That would be ideal, so, but it's just not. So, you know what? Let me give you an example. If you move a container box from inland China or inland India, take it since you, you guys are more friendly with them these days, but in, inland India to inland US, okay. on average, there are 16 stakeholders involved to to make that movement happen so i'm thinking i'm meaning local truckers on both ends people stuffing and stripping the container box operating the cranes uh doing the vessels uh, moving the container box to back and forth from the uh, facilities and doing the warehouse services and then customs those yeah. that's like simply if i explain right 16 stakeholders uh, now, if you take one of our companies, uh, uh, customers, uh, they would have 3,000 different trade routes, as an example. Yeah. All of those will be multiplied with 16 in order to facilitate and have their supply chains running. That, that's the global scope of, of stakeholders involved for one big international company, right? Yeah. So what I'm saying is that we as a company, what we've realized is that the scope here is so big that what we should do is that we should collect the best data sets in the world for air and ocean freight shipments. And then we should allow everybody else to build on top of that. That's how we think about building a platform. So we will collect the data and make sense of the data. And then all these other services that you can build on top in order to have those supply chains flow, we will make our data accessible and available for those kind of players. And I think yeah. that's, yeah, that's so. I, I really think we're a, a data and product company, right? So deeply sort of rooted in that data and understanding it, and then we build data uh, software 
that allows us to make sense of it, but even more importantly, allowing others to access the data as well. So is that just as a developer, I can access it through APIs or, or how do I get that data? We do it with APIs, yeah. Okay. Can you maybe give us some examples of how some of your customers have actually pulled your data into their platforms? Yeah, so so actually you can we can go through all different core sort of stakeholders, but if you look at the shipping lines just to begin with, we have okay. for instance our data going into their pricing algorithm to help them with sure. their pricing towards their clients, right? Yeah. Then there's um uh supply chain simulation software that uses the data to help a customer uh answer the question of where should I put my warehouses globally in sort of in, in order to optimize for transportation spend, where we will just fill one of the data sets that is required in order to do that. And we're not offering that service at all. So you can go in many different directions with different types of companies, whether it's consultancies, tech companies, or whether it's the core stakeholders, such as the buyers and the sellers. Fascinating. And then again, you're just, uh, mission critical type app for these companies right because they're leveraging you across different things like not only are you giving them pricing from both sides you're also giving them other information to that is core to run their business it might be one of five pieces of data in your warehouse example but yeah, yeah. that's another like sticking point for you guys right to be yeah. yeah that's fascinating very cool that's awesome yeah, I love it. I, it's it's pretty niche in terms of like the industry itself, but it's a it's a big niche, so I love it. But you're also solving a real problem, right? And I think yeah. that's also really good advice to people looking. Like, sure, you know, saying I'm I'm going to create another social network these days is like I guess in theory doable. But I think if you want to create like a really good business, you find these niches, right? Yeah. And you hope it's big, and you hope it's kind of your first to market in them, right? Yeah. Is the reality. So yeah. I'm curious, as we kind of come to the end of the show, any other advice for entrepreneurs uh, that maybe you wish you knew earlier on in your career that you'd like to pass on? Ooh, there's tons of things that I think, I think, I think one of the things that I personally have sort of benefited the most from yeah. is that I, I think I'm pretty good at, at seeing new ways. So, so you get a lot of no's and a lot of closed doors. That doesn't mean it doesn't necessarily work or it means that you just got it slightly wrong. So you got to try again. So uh, there is something about that grit and the ability to not sort of get too worn out by all those no's and disappointments, but you got to be, you got to adjust, right? So you can't be, and I think this is an important balance. You can't be just stubborn and think that it's going to work. And I'll, I'll, I could give so many examples of mistakes we've done. Sure. Right, because we were so curious and so excited in the beginning, so we ended up doing so many things. And once we sort of hone in on on something that worked, then we we really stayed with that and and ran it as fast as we could. Right? Sure. Um. Yeah. But, but yeah, that's not necessarily um, a recommendation. That I guess. Yeah, it would be along the the lines of that, man. It, you can go. That's such a broad topic. Yeah, you could almost do another hour on that. But yeah. no, I but I actually think that's really good advice and like tweaking your messaging and kind of never giving up and honing on trying to figure out where your piece is of the big pie, right? Is is really challenging or it can be. And then never yeah. giving up. Yeah. And it's it's a little bit like I almost get triggered by when people say no, but it doesn't mean that I'm stubborn and clinging on to what I thought was right, but I'm I'm going to find this sort of like the closest thing that are going to move them to agree with me. Yeah, interesting. So I'm curious then, of all the no's that you got in those four years, how yeah. many of them are now customers? A bunch of them? Ah, that, oh, we have so, so many good stories of that. Like, listen, I'll tell you a good story. It's super okay. quick. So in 2013, I, I, I demo one of the biggest companies in the world. Uh, we've uh, spent like a long time to get to know them. We did not have data on their trades because it was Asia to US. We only had Asia to Europe at that point. I okay. demo them that they, they, they tell me in the meeting, if you're ever going to see our data, you'll have to pay us a lot of money. Right? Okay. And we hung up. It was a good, it was a good friendly meeting, but like he made it clear, no yeah. way. We don't yeah. share our data. 
and you, you, no way will get, uh, you, you'll get it even, even if you pay kind of thing. Then in 2020, they became a customer. Yeah, interesting. Paying, paying like six-digit six subscription to access our platform. So I'm not paying them. They're paying us to give their data in and get the intel. Did they ever tell you what the, like, what was the... Yeah, the main, um, amount of data. So as, as they said, you just have so much volume in there now that we need to see how we stack up in order to understand our performance. And, and I, I love them It's because they also remember the first meeting. And this, I think, is incredibly... Uh, important point as i mentioned that whole grit thing you should always be as nice as you possibly can because you will meet them again yeah oh well, that's 100 percent. it's that's actually really good advice actually yeah. like never piss off especially yeah. in your industry if they say no a hundred times you never know yeah. like they came back what seven years later for you yeah yeah which is an eternity in tech right like seven yeah. years is a very long time in tech yes. like you waited patiently. <laughs> we have we have no quite a, a lot of these four or five years yeah. uh, of waiting, and we we just we I, I always said they will always come. They will always come. Don't worry. We just recycle them year after year after year, and they will come. Yeah, interesting. No, I think that's it's really good advice. But sadly, we're out of time. So how about we close yeah. with mentioning where people can get more information about yourself, the company, and any other links you want to mention. Yeah, go to zanera.com to read about uh, the company. And connect on LinkedIn. And, uh, I'll, I'll uh, reply and pick it up as, as quickly as I can. Perfect. And it's xeneta.com. Beautiful. Perfect, Patrick. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show. And I uh, have a good rest of your day, man. And I really appreciate it. Hey, Kevin. Thanks a lot for having me on. A, a real pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Patrick, I thought that was really good. How'd you feel about that? No, all good, all good. You're, you're very yeah, laid back and easy to chat with. So yeah, that's good. Oh, I'm yeah. We had a good chat. I I like that. It's interesting. I like curious about some of this stuff, right? I'm always curious to have people that I don't really like. Obviously, supply chain industry affects me every day, but I don't really know anybody that I haven't really had anybody on the, the show before that actually is like in the trenches mm. doing this kind of stuff i guess is the easiest way to say it yeah so it's cool man appreciate that that really do hey uh i i got a back back in five i need a minute i need a technical anything else we should cover no nope, that's good man i'll let you guys know when it's up and airing um and then if you have any other questions please feel free to reach out to me beautiful appreciate it man okay. thanks, thanks a lot man. Okay, bye here's bye Thanks for listening. Please visit our website at buildingthefutureshow.com to join the free community, sign up for our newsletter, or to sponsor the show. The music is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com. And keep building the future.